Warren Lee. Glad to see you that you're here. Uh, kids, if you want to shake eggs this morning, come on. We'll, we'll have some fun with this. Let the guys get through with the torches first. Are there any other announcements? Well, then get up and give a good Hoosier warm welcome to the people around you. Good morning again. It is uh, indeed a pleasure to see all everybody here as we survive the cold weather. Uh, I got 
week, Warren and I were talking about our daughter in, in uh, Venezuela, the Wednesday uh, after was, and that went to with 45, and she was sitting in the pool where it was supposed to be 90 something. Uh, she wasn't really very sorry for her. So, and, uh, and, uh, they were great. Uh, maybe I need to rephrase that. We are, we have, we have been uh, honored by having Grace play with us, and they came and pray with us. Let's prepare our hearts and minds as we go into a time of worship as we listen to that prayer. Gracious God, we come to you this day seeking your guidance and strength. You have called us to ministries for which we feel inadequate. Help us to understand that it is your love that will support and sustain our efforts. Give us the courage to place our trust in your mind. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. In my anguish, I cry to the Lord. His love endures forever. And he answers by setting me free. His love endures forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The Lord leads him to our church and have eternal life. God never really leaves us. His love for us is doing so. Join us to We pray to the Lord of
What else can we do? We can do what these are people can do. Do you have a hand? Three each other in us. So when Jesus asked Peter that, he asked us the same question. And he said, what you, if you love me, what are you going to do to prove that? How are you going to treat each other? Be nice to each other? So remember, that's what we are. If, when we say we're disciples of Jesus, we are going to love people the way that Jesus loved us. Now, this is February, and I know February is, is that special month that love is really marketed and Valentine Day, what do we want to give? What's, what's a good symbol of love? Valentine? Heart? So I've got something for each of you at the risk of making all your mothers mad at me. And then we're going to say a prayer. You yeah. did. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we God, we just give you thanks for being stuck with heaven here. It's really because we remember what does it mean, what does it truly mean to love one another? Help us to show that love with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I forget my job this morning. Uh, you may be seated. Sing the next hymn, which is free and clear, at number 389. Uh, and uh, somebody died. Uh, 
a heart attack. They're not sure what they're doing. So I'm testing now, but uh, it was a shock to the family. They're still in shock, but uh, recently I'm trying to keep that family in with your prayers as well as we figure out what's going on. So we're going to do that going forward this week. Uh, from Alice Reynolds, Jamie struggling with the job and, and simply struggling with being far from home. So Jamie and, and all that. And then from Barb Stuffle, um, Claiborne Cliff Lonsley uh, passed away uh, unexpectedly. Uh, Claiborne is more of, well, it's just as much family for Barb as, as anything else. Uh, and so keep uh, the ones of family. He's the president and CEO of the Monterey Cook National Bank in Monterey. And those are the purposes that have been lifted up. Are there other purposes that Lord bless us? Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the prayers and the well wishes while I had in the hospital. Appreciate it very much. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's see. I think we have a prayer in the Why don't you just go to prayer? God, if I speak in the languages of humankind or the angel, angelicals, but do, do not have love, I am just a noisy, tiny symbol. If I have wonderful power to see our great possibilities of serving the Lord and the wondrous journey God has placed before us, but I don't have love in my heart and in my actions, I am just making empty promises. God, Far too often, we are like that crying symbol of empty promises. We got to say that we want to do things, but we back away because we think things will be too tough for us. We don't believe that you will be guiding us, that you will be there offering us healing and strength for the service that you call us to do. So we simply back off. We just go through the motions. God, remind us that in you, love resides. In you, all hope and peace and justice lives. Remind us that your love is poured out for all of us. Even before the beginning of time, teach us again that great message of hope. Remind us that love is risk. That we risk century, that we risk alienation. By doing the things that you have called us to do as your people. But remind us that you will be with us through every step of the way. You got to come to you this morning in this holy place. You've heard those prayer concerns. Concerns for the family of Claiborne and Blondie. Good down that neighbor. For Lisa and Freddie. For Jamie. God, you know each and every one of those situations. You know all the needs of those that are listed in our bulletin. Pour out the Holy Spirit, your healing spirit, on those individuals, those families. Give them a sense of peace and comfort. It comes because you are the great healing. God. God, we come to you lifting up to you our country in the midst of conflict. Remind us that we are the united people. That together we can do the great things. So we pray for our leaders at all of us regardless of which political party we belong to. God, we pray that they would make the right decisions. We pray constantly for our young men and women in the armed forces. Pray that you would do your best to keep us in harm's way. Look up to that personal prayer for the people of Venezuela and my daughter Carrie. Even though the school's got that evacuation plan, that you would continue to be the people in the situation that cool heads would prevail. That people would be safe. God, we take the moment of silence now. Each of us gathered here has our own 
concerning our own needs, our own hurts. Or that we bury deep inside, and then God, you know what we have, what we hold back. God, we pray that in the moment of silence, you would simply lift those burdens from us. Remind us of the love that you have for each and every one of us. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the blessings that you have poured out on each and every one of us as we pray the prayer that your son taught us with these words, saying, Our Father, Lord, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this great our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we do not have the temptation but deliver us from evil, for the hands of the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the crowd. Will the ushers wait upon us as we give our offering? Because Jesus had asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. The word of the Holy Scripture for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was reminded by several people after the earlier uh, that somebody's playing basketball at 11 o'clock. Uh, and so I'm not sure what that meant. And then you know, there's a part of the other set. Where I wanted being an Iowa, where I was thinking of this well. I wanted to say something, but then I remember I got a lot of pretty things out here, so we'll keep it. We'll try to get you out on time. Remember, we're continuing this sermon series for the last month. Uh, we've been talking about Peter, we've been, and we're using Peter as an example, really, of what it means to be a disciple. But, but we're really focusing on the fact that is what does it mean? What is the difference between being a member and being a disciple? Because there's a huge difference on on how we treat one another and, and, and what that ramification means. If, if we are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, then what does that mean for us on the way that we live our lives and the way that we treat each other and the way that we love one another? And so we use Peter as an example of, of watching 
Peter's growth, if you really will. Remember, he started from those very, those, that, that, that challenge, if you will, or the power in those words, come and follow. That what, what was there about Jesus, what is there about Jesus, that when he issued those words that would cause Peter and, and, and James and John and all of those disciples to simply drop everything, to leave everything else behind, to leave families behind, to leave their, 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 their work, whatever it was, to follow. Without any question. Last week we talked about, we finally got to the point where, where, where Peter found himself denying Jesus and realized the forgiveness that Jesus offered. And then in that moment of forgiveness, we find it, that's where we find transformation. That's where we find where when, when, when Jesus offers us that love and grace and forgiveness. And we recognize that and we accept that. That, that our lives truly begin to transform. And we become disciples. We're no longer members or but we're rather those followers that are willing to follow and do what Jesus has asked us to do. So we're kind of picking up again where we left off last week. Where, and remember, Peter had denied Jesus. Jesus was crucified. The disciples have scattered. We picked up where there's a point where, where they're Maybe in that upper room, maybe in wherever they were hiding. And Peter makes that statement where, well, you know, when, when you're at that point where you're not sure where you're at, you're not sure what's going to happen, and, and you need to find that comfort zone, that, that place where you can go, where you, where you know you're going to be safe, or at least that, that you feel that that's where you're going to be safe. Peter says, I'm going to fish. Because that's what he knows. And the others say, we're going with you. And, and they, they go fishing, and they fish all night, and they catch nothing. And, and it's, from the very beginning, it, it's like we come for a circle where Jesus fished met them, and, and now he's the resurrected Lord, and he's on the shore, they don't recognize him, and he, and he shouts out to them, have you, have you caught anything? They've been fishing all night, and they say no. And he tells them, well, you know, put your net on the right side. And so they follow those instructions and they catch that large number of fish, 153. And then it's that beloved disciple that reminds them it is Jesus. And Peter, being Peter, stepped out of the boat once again. Now remember that story before. There was a time, remember, that when Jesus was walking on the water at night, coming towards them, and Peter had called out and said, if it's you, then, then call me to come out to meet you. And, and Jesus called him, and Peter got out of the boat and started walking on that water. But, but he took his eyes off of Jesus. He began to doubt. He began to fear. And then he began to sink. This time Peter gets out of the boat, and he's not worried about walking on water. The only thing he's worried about is getting through it. And he's not about to take his eyes off of Jesus this time. And he gets to the shore. Now try to picture for just a moment what you think Peter might have felt for just an instant as he came out of that, that water and the cool breeze in the morning. Maybe he had a flashback of what that cold night was when he denied it. Jesus had built a charcoal fire with cooking fish, but maybe the smell of that charcoal fire would bring back memories to Peter when he denied What was going through the minds of Peter as he made his way once again, realizing that this was the resurrected Jesus? 
And then we have those questions. And we read them, and, and, and I, sometimes I think it's, it's hard to really understand what Peter might have been feeling. Because sometimes I think, you know, you know when somebody asks you a question and it just cuts through the heart? Because you've done something. And Jesus looks right at you. Imagine those piercing eyes looking at you and saying, do you love me? Peter responds, of course, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And Peter's trying to think everything's going to be okay. And, 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 but Jesus doesn't give up. He looked at him again with those piercing eyes. Peter, do you love me? Peter once again, probably thinking at this point, okay, maybe you didn't hear me. But Lord, you know I love you. Jesus, feed my lambs. And if we just stopped right there, maybe Peter would have felt okay. It's the same question. Almost the same question that Peter was asked that night when he denied him. Someone said, you were there. You were one of them. You are one of his followers. He said, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And what he's really asking, Peter, are you with me or not? I mean, are you with me? Are you going to be one of my followers? Will you be one of my disciples? Peter, do you love me? And Peter's not that dense that he doesn't understand where it's going, what those questions mean. And it's a question that each and every one of us has to answer at some point in time. Because Jesus asked, do you love me? Are you one of my disciples? Are you one of my followers? Are you going to follow and do what I am instructing you to do? Peter has asked that third time, do you really, truly love me? It's an invitation. Come and follow. Be my disciple. It's an invitation, but it's an invitation that is not easy to follow. Because when Jesus asks us to be his disciples, to come and follow him, it means that we are willing to put down everything else in order to follow him. That he comes before everything else in our lives. That he's number one. Do you love me? It's a reminder that we're called to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our soul to love. You know, there's only a few chapters back from where we are where Jesus met with those disciples in that upper room in the Gospel of John where he takes off his garment and he begins to wash their feet. It's like that type of setting that he wants us to remember. It's like, because here's what love is all about. To love one another. He says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. What does it mean for you to be a father? What does it mean for you to call yourself a disciple in this church. Well, one, one way of putting it is uh, Emmanuel Sirhard writes it this way. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ means to live your life in such a way that your life would have no meaning 
if Jesus didn't exist. Being a disciple means that your life would have no meaning whatsoever if God didn't exist. That's what it means. Peter recognizes Jesus. For who Jesus is. Because it's not Jesus who called him to follow. It's not Jesus that he'd been following for two years. It's not Jesus who had given him those teachings over the last year. But this is the resurrected Lord. Death had been conquered. Peter understood that. That death no longer has the final word. And it's in that understanding that allows us to have this reality. And that no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what the pain and hurt, whatever the circumstances are, they don't have the final word. Jesus made that possible. And Peter understood that because from this moment on, Peter becomes the rock. Peter becomes the rock that, that Jesus said that he would become. And we know that Peter is crucified upside down because he felt unworthy. As we read throughout the gospel, we read where Peter and the other disciples now become bold, are willing to be those outspoken critics, regardless of the consequences. And they're all killed in some way, except John. But Peter makes those famous words that we hear that he's not worthy to be crucified the same way and he's crucified upside down. Or C.J. Chesterton writes these words, he was crucified upside down and he saw the landscape as it really is with the stars like flowers and the clouds like hills and all men hanging on the mercy of God. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know if you can identify with Peter. I don't know if you've been wrestling with God lately. I don't know the hurt and the pains and, and the struggles that you are going to. I don't know if you feel like you've fallen so far down that you can't get back up. That you've gone so far down that hole that God can never reach you. But I'm here this morning to tell you that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are going to stumble and we are going to fall. But the good news is that God does not give up on us. That there's nothing that you have said or done that can make God love you any less than what he does. The good news is that that does not have the last word. There's a thing called repentance and forgiveness. God's grace and mercy. And it's through that grace and mercy that we are called to feed his sheep. To be there for one another. The good news is that in the midst of all of our sin and suffering, in the midst of all our unfaithfulness, there is a way back. There is restoration. I know because I've experienced it. And through the grace and mercy of God, I'm here this morning. There's a time when I, when I was so far down that rabbit hole, I didn't think I'd ever find my way back. But God's grace and mercy and forgiveness gives you the strength to do the things that God has called you to do. It's through that grace and mercy that we are empowered to be his disciples, to feed his sheep. We all have to answer those questions. Come and follow. When you hear those words, if you have heard those words, how are you going to respond? What is the message that God gives us? 
Well, one folklore has, tells a story like this. The young boy asked his grandmother, what's the difference between heaven and hell? And the grandmother said, well, hell is like this. The great big table filled with all the most wonderful food that you can imagine. All the most of that the lonely order, that that aroma, that food, I get it out here in a minute. That wonderful aroma, aroma. Struggled with that one, didn't it? It's everything you can imagine. And everybody's given six foot long chopsticks. And the chopsticks grow and shrink to allow you to reach any kind of food that you want that's on this table. The problem is the chopsticks are too long for you to feed yourself. That's what hell is like. And the little boy said, well, if that's what hell is like, what's like heaven like? And the grandmother said, well, heaven is like this. It's a great big round table. Long table. Filled with all these good food, with all the smell that you can imagine. It. And everyone's given these six foot long chopsticks. And they, and they grow and shrink. Allowing you to grab any amount of the food, any type of food you want on this table. And the little boy looked at him and said, Well, that sounds just like hell. What's the difference? And the grandmother said, Because the servants of heaven have learned to feed one another. That's the difference. Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. He asked you the same question. Will you feed my sheep? One of the ways that we do that, one of the ways that we remember when we take Holy Communion, when we remember those words that Jesus met with his disciples in that upper room. I think we have a liturgy coming up. Do we? No liturgy? She did, right? That's not it. That's okay. We'll get by without it. Remember. When he met in that upper room. I mean, one of my favorite stories I told you over and over again is, is the story of Cleopas and his companion in the Gospel of Luke. We do have it. <coughs> Christ our Lord invites to the table all who love him. For earnest repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Join me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us with joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here's the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so we the people on earth and all the company of heaven. We praise your name and join in our many him. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of the suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many 
to the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out the Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to the entire world. Until Christ comes in that final victory, we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for you. Remember in the eye of this church, you do not need to be a member of this church or any other church to participate in Holy Communion. This is not our table. This is the Lord's table. And the Lord's table is open to all who accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. But after you come down, we've got bread that you receive. You can dip in the cup by intention, or there are cups at the rail that if you want to go to the rail, they are gluten-free for those who need gluten-free and special gifts for them as well. Lord's table set. Come as you are ready. Let's stand in Jerry while we'll sing our closing hymn, Victory and Jesus.
follow? Are you willing to take up your cross and leave everything else behind? To deny everything else and accept him as your Lord and Savior. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Go in peace. The peace of God goes with you. Amen and amen. Thank <laughs> you.